live everywhere. Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Wall, K Grill in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. All right, let's try this all again. One more time. It's Friday, July 28th, 2017, so we'll have a slightly shortened show today by about six minutes. I think we can hang in there and maybe we'll fill in some bonus content and give people a new incentive to, well, I can't even use it. There's new incentive to sign up as uh, supporters of the show, but you can enjoy a, a shorter show. I don't know. It's Friday. Everybody leave early. How about that? We're going to start early instead. We do things backwards here. Uh, okay. I think we got everything fixed up here. I was hoping to uh, be able to monkey with the levels on Skype a little bit here so that we could get things evened out. I know we had some difficulty with the new applications when we had Armando on the other day. Armando's not the best test case for that necessarily because he's not using a nice beautiful microphone set up the way we do very often with Greg Dwork. And Greg is actually set to make a what will be a guest appearance today. I guess they're all guest appearances, but this is a guest guest appearance. Of course, he has been out for vacation for some time and normally is not around with us on Friday, but it is a big health care Friday, so we will make room for him. Uh, everything is working now, thankfully. Uh, the new application's pretty easy to use, but, uh, well, uh, Tom will talk a little bit about what I tried to do to try and, uh, uh, work out the sound problems. I don't know if that had anything to do with it. It may have just been a failure of nice cast to wake up in the morning. I looked and I saw that there were no levels there. I just shut it all down, rebooted, and, uh, cleaned up the, uh, the hijack situation. We'll talk about that offline. In the meantime, we're here. We made it. We got our bill passed, I guess, in a sense. That's uh, what we'll be talking about largely today. Those of you who stayed up late last night to watch the happenings in the Senate are crazy. You should never do that. Uh, we'll see whether Greg did that and uh, ask him. Well, because he's ready to go. He's he's ready and raring to go. Let's try out our new system. Hey, good morning, Greg. How you doing? Hey, good morning. How are you? Okay. Everything sounds good on my end so far. Well, everything sounds pretty good on my end, and too, except are... I have a slight cold, so I may have to like disappear to cough and then come back because, that of course, okay. as a radio professional, I always remember to hit the mute button when I do that. Yes, and nothing better for a summer cold than Iceland. Yes, so. land of ice and fire. Yes. How's the fire? Uh, it was absolutely spectacular. I'd like to tell you that I'm broadcasting from the slopes of the volcano, Ayafiat but uh, I'm not. Oh, well. Okay. Uh, I, I was practicing that for 10 days. <laughs> but uh, uh, those yeah. of us uh, who are uh, not Icelandic actually pronounce it E15. E oh. That is to say, E followed by 15 letters. That's the common American <laughs> pronunciation uh, for it. I was wondering whether that was some sort of like, uh, well, you know. The, 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 the it's 16 two. letters, so it's okay. E15. I, you know, that K2, you know. Yeah, yeah, you guys, you guys e work 15. out the rest. I have the And it's, it's very difficult to say, very difficult to say. I have Fjordli Jokl. But, uh, it's wonderful. They, they make a little, like, at the end. Jokl. I don't yeah, know so why that could, happens. Yeah, Jokl. But... So I actually sent you a, a little video yeah. of an Icelander, oh. uh, pra uh, pronunciation of it yes. if you want to use it on the show at any time. I, uh, is that Magnus? I have seen him. Uh, I, I opened up one. Yeah, let me see what the one you you sent. It's right but, at the bottom. Uh, okay, yeah. he yeah, there's a he's a very he's a funny guy. Uh, yes, but I don't, I only did okay. the pronunciation. I made it very short. Okay, I oh I have fjordljok. Uh, well, okay. Let me let's get on to the the, the health bill. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> have something to drink and sneeze, and then you're good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Ooh, speaking and we could talk about the vacation speaking. anytime you want. It was a wonderful, wonderful trip. We did a about whole hour green, now. Uh, trip around the island. Uh, but uh, I, I am now addicted to skier and waffles for breakfast. Thank it you, is Jeff. really good. And I started buying. And there's some nice skier uh, products here in the U.S., that are terrific. I like Siggy's. That's Icelandic yogurt, and it's yeah. absolutely delicious. It's, it tastes a little different, but they did a good job with it. Uh, and I don't, I never liked yogurt. I, I was talking about yogurt yesterday. I always would forego the yogurt, never liked it, tried that. Hey, I think I like yogurt. And I don't know why. It just Maybe it was the charm of being in Iceland. Right. It is uh, good. People are wonderful. Everybody speaks English except for this one little farm that we found. Oh. Where the only languages spoken actually were Icelandic and German. 
Oh, well, they had a they had an out. Well, yeah. You just didn't have the uh, German for them, huh? Right, and uh, this is actually a, 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 a turf farm that's actually still lived in by the descendants of the original turf farmers. A tur- I've and always so been they have a, like a, a 50, 150 year old uh, a farmhouse, hmm. which is built into the side of the mountain, made with uh, turf and stone, and uh, a long table right down the middle, the way people lived 150 years ago. It's absolutely wonderful. Cool. But that's not why we're here. We're here to talk about health care. Wow. And uh, so there's two ways to look at what happened yesterday. There's the super duper dramatic way, and then there's actually what happened. Which one do you want to do first? Um, let's do the super duper dramatic. Okay, that's good. For that one, I have a piece by uh, Ed O'Keefe at the Post, uh, Washington ah. Post. The okay, night John McCain mean. killed the GOP's health care fight, and it's a word. By hmm. word, blow by blow description hmm. of what happened when McCain walked into the Senate, went over to Schumer, yes. whispered something to him, and Schumer looked elated, although he later said he already knew what McCain was going to do because McCain had called him. Oh. And all the Democrats who were dour started to cheer up, and the Republicans who didn't know what was going on hmm. were watching. And they saw McCain do this, and they saw... The Democrats get excited, and they started to get a little uncomfortable because they didn't really know what was going on. Yeah. And then the vote came, and this was on the uh, skinny uh, repeal, so-called skinny repeal, which, again, to set this up, the hard-crafted compromise uh, polar payoff amalgamum that – McConnell had crafted, had failed. Hard crafted. Straight repeal had failed. Yeah, lots of fails. And so McConnell came up with this uh, technocratic solution, Mm. which was, as the Republicans put it, not really a bill. At least they didn't want it passed. They wanted it passed as a placeholder. Yes. But they didn't vote for it if they thought that it was actually going to become law. They wanted a firm commitment from Paul Ryan that the House would simply vote yes, uh, but in a convoluted way. They wanted the House to agree that this was close enough. You have to explain the mechanism here for Paul Ryan's choices. They wanted the House to bring this skinny repeal that they didn't want passed to conference. And they wanted a guarantee that Paul Ryan would bring it to conference and not simply pass the skinny repeal because the Republicans didn't want the skinny repeal to pass. They were just using it as a place marker. Yes. Now, Paul Ryan said, okay, maybe. (laughs) And Lindsey Graham said, this is a terrible bill. It's awful. If this ever became law, it would be a disaster. But okay, that's good enough for me. I say yes. Same with Ron Johnson. I'm a little Uh surprised at them because they had made such a big point of saying that we want this bill to fail, but only by passing it. Yes. Isn't that great? And it was such a weird discussion that you scratch your head and say, wait a minute, guys, how could you possibly pass this? And in the end, what undid it, uh, for, for many, many reasons, the resistance, the Democrats sticking together under Schumer, the amazing uh, non-folding Susan Collins and Lisa mm. Murkowski. Yes. And maybe even the backlash from Trump threatening Murkowski. But in the end, what undid this bill was Republicans not trusting each other. Mm. Yeah. McCain didn't trust that Paul Ryan would, in fact, go to conference. And that if he did go to conference, he'd say, okay, we talked about a conference uh, collaboration bill for like 30 seconds. That failed. Let's just pass yeah. the skinny repeal. Yep. Entirely possible. I'm not having any of this. And in the end, in a very dramatic gesture, he walked onto the floor when it was time for him to vote. Only after Mike Pence, well, first, uh, uh, Jeff Flake, his colleague from Arizona, who's an a-hole of the first degree, because the same reasons that McCain didn't want this bill, Flake shouldn't have wanted this bill. But, of course, Flake is running and is afraid of a primary. So Flake was sent as a emissary to talk to McCain. McCain wouldn't even talk to him. Completely Mm. ignored Flake and just talked to his friend Lindsey Graham. 
That didn't work. So then they sent Pence. Mm-hmm. And Pence goes out. He's there because if it's a 50-50 vote, of course, he has to break the tie. Yeah. He goes over to talk to McCain for an hour while they hold the vote open. And McCain doesn't budge. Then McCain gets a call from the president. And right after that call, comes back to the floor, goes to vote, and gives a thumbs down, and then mm. walks off the mm. well of the Senate. That must have been some vote. call from the president. And there's gasps, and there's applause from the Democrats, because they really didn't expect this. Yeah. Huh. As, as Ed O'Keefe describes it, the blood drains out of Cornyn's face. He turns there white. There wasn't any in there. McConnell turns as pink as his tie. And then gets up and says, well, obviously, this is very embarrassing, and then uh, we'll figure it out tomorrow. Okay. But That's else? today. That's the dramatic version. Okay. But the better version, I think, which is what really happened, was James Holman describing in the Daily 202, as we know, that's the Washington area code. Yes. Trump's hardball tactics backfire as skinny repeal goes down. Yeah. The big idea, he says, President Trump's attacks on Republican senators are finally catching up with him, and Lisa Murkowski will not be bullied. And it's interesting how he describes both Murkowski's vote and McCain's vote, which I think is very smart because I think that's what actually happened. A last-ditch effort to keep the Obamacare repeal effort alive went down by a vote of 49 to 51 in the wee hours of Friday morning. I think the vote was like 1.30 a.m. I didn't stay up for it. I was exhausted from traveling, so I got up this morning at like 4 a.m. and uh, said, oh, my goodness. And then I went back and I looked at YouTube and I saw the dramatic gesture by McCain and all the, oh, McCain, McCain, McCain stuff. I think we need to put this in perspective. Okay. So. McCain, Collins, and Murkowski vote. No, the bill goes down. Right. McConnell pulls the legislation from consideration and says the magic words, the incantation we've all been waiting for, it's time to move on, a dejected majority leader said. So, Holman points out, number one, there's nothing Trump can do anymore that'll get to McCain. Battling an aggressive form of brain cancer, the Maverick was willing to vote no on the skinny repeal so that other GOP colleagues, this is the important part, who were also opposed to the measure, could vote yes to save face with the conservative base. In other words, McCain is running cover Mm -hmm. for Heller, for Capito, for Portman, for Morant, for whoever. He's the vote that's going to be no. He doesn't really care what happens to him at this particular point in time. Mm -hmm. And he's saving his colleagues from having to vote no and put up with being bothered, annoyed by Trump. And it's ah. only bothering and annoying because Trump is losing his potency, as we'll talk about in a minute. Yes. To this day, Trump has never apologized for saying that the former fighter pilot was not a war hero because he got captured in Vietnam. It gets less attention. But the president also besmirched the Arizona senator's character by repeatedly accusing him of not taking care of other veterans. McCain has never mm. forgotten. Uh, well, good. Now, Holman points out correctly, a lot of the media coverage in the wake of the vote We'll focus on McCain, and Collins was always going to vote no, but Murkowski's opposition was equally decisive and perhaps more illustrative of the problems ahead for Trump. All right. Trump, who won Alaska by 15 points, ripped the state's senior senator on Twitter Wednesday after she opposed the key procedural motion to open debate on health care. Yes. The Senator Lisa Murkowski tweeted, of the great state of Alaska really let the Republicans in our country down yesterday too bad. Later that day, Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke, yeah. is that how he pronounces his uh, name? That's the way we decided it yesterday, yeah. Ryan? Yeah, that's correct. I'm with Zinke, but I'm not R- sure Ryan. how to pronounce Ryan. Called Murkowski and the state's other Republican senator, Dan Sullivan, to threaten, and Sullivan, by the way, is a, uh, a spineless coward, uh, oh. to threaten that the Trump administration may change its position on several issues that affect the state to punish Murkowski, including blocking energy exploration and plans to allow the construction of new roads. The message was pretty clear, Sullivan told the Alaska Dispatch News. And what he didn't add is, and therefore I caved, because mm-hmm. my constituents are just as important to me as they are to Murkowski, and I don't really care. He yeah. threatened me, and I'm folding. That's I guess. He was he ever a no? No. Yeah, so Why wasn't he a no? This is just as bad for Alaska for him as it is for bad for Alaska for yeah. Murkowski. Well, Why he wasn't no he no? Hey, he's got no... Experience. 
Yeah. Oh, well, that too. Uh, it, yes, I, I mean, why he didn't talk to Murkowski. I mean, it was obvious what Murkowski was doing, why he didn't speak to her and say, what's up with this whole thing about it being bad for Alaska? Because I, I just realized I'm here from Alaska, but he never bothers. Nevertheless, and I like this phrasing, Murkowski persisted. <laughs> In fact, she took it one step further and demonstrated that she has more leverage over Zinke than he has over her. As chairman of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, Burkowski indefinitely postponed a nomination markup that the Interior Department badly wants. Huh. Hello. Okay. That's strange. This is how it's done in Washington. You don't just go threaten people who actually have oversight over you. Sure you do. Well, it didn't oh. work. This demonstrated oh. the degree to which Zinke's ham-handed phone call was political malpractice. The secretary, whoever at the White House ordered him to make the call, clearly doesn't understand the awesome power that comes with being the chairman of a Senate committee. Huh. Yes. If they choose to use it, that is. Only an amateur would threaten a person who has oversight over his agency. If she wants, Murkowski can make Zinke's life so unbelievably miserable he has no idea. He may have no idea. A Murkowski spokeswoman denied that putting off the hearing was revenge or retaliation, even if you believe that and color a skeptical. Postponing the hearing sent the crystal clear message to the administration that she's not to be messed with. I base my votes on what I believe in is Alaska's best interest, Murkowski told reporters with a smile. That is weird. Senators serve six-year terms so they're more insulated from pressure than representatives who are up every two years. Murkowski, who easily won a fourth term last year, is not up again until 2022 when Trump may no longer be president. Fourth term, is that right? Yeah. Machiavelli said it's better to be fair than love. For many Republican senators, Trump is neither. And uh, he goes on to point out, over on the Hill, this week has felt like it might be a turning point of sorts. Republican lawmakers have openly defied President Trump in meaningful ways this week amid growing frustration on Capitol Hill, erratic behavior, Mm -hmm. and willingness to trample on governing norms, Mike DeBonis reports. They passed legislation to stop him from lifting sanctions on Russia. They recoiled at a snap decision to ban transgender Americans in the military. And they warned him in no uncertain terms not to fire the attorney general or the special counsel investigating the president and his aides. And all of those things were tweeted by people like Chuck Grassley and even, uh, you know, his uh, comments to the Boy Scouts, which I'm sure you covered. I didn't have a chance to hear it. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, were, were, or Hatch and other people you normally wouldn't expect basically said it was totally inappropriate. And, of course, the military said, we're not listening to you. So there's a whole lot that happened this week that necessarily uh, isn't to uh, Trump's uh, benefit and, re- and redound. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, not much in the way of uh, helpful for him, but uh, the rest of us enjoyed it. Maybe we did. And, and we really did enjoy it, by the way. I know we were warned not to celebrate, and, and I guess this is nothing is ever necessarily the end of a zombie bill, but uh, it looks to be gone for the moment. And, and yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's inappropriate to celebrate some. I don't know. I'm not certain it really is. Uh, I'm actually very, very happy on a personal level, personally, yep. that Donald Trump, the disgusting person, lost face here. Yep. And uh, so did Mitch McConnell, who's yeah. no less uh, oh, yeah, ex- too. Right. McConnell is just a horrible human being. And this is what happens when you have a completely technocratic approach to legislating. And by the way, uh, also what happens when you try to write an important bill that affects uh, between a fifth and a sixth of the economy of the country in like two hours before it's ready to vote. Hmm. It doesn't work. So I agree with McCain. Let's go back to regular order, meaning let's go through the committees next time. Yeah, that would be a good idea. There was, in fact, a vote yesterday. I was uh, upset to see everybody. Uh, saying, oh, here's a here's a motion to send the legislation back to committee, which is usually the motion to recommit. And I was, uh, of course, what do you mean? What's this back to business? This never was in committee. This is a motion to commit, not a motion to recommit. So uh, you got to commit before you can recommit. Yeah, I think so. And uh, they have a problem with commitment, these guys. Right. So the digital director for Tammy Baldwin, Nathan Nye, who also used to work for Maggie Hassa. Has a nice little uh, tweet storm here. I just want to go over. All right. We can and the reason is, I get what McCain did, and McCain did do a heroic thing. He was under a tremendous amount of pressure, and he decided he was the one that was going to run interference for uh, the rest of his Republican colleagues. So let's give him credit for that. But as Nathan Nye says, let's talk about the women senators. Of course, All as right. a Democrat. 
He says, uh, we have some thank yous to make. So Senator Parity Murray, Maisie Hirono, she just showed up with cancer, stage four kidney cancer, not expecting applause mm. and vote. Right. McCain right. isn't the only one that came back with a cancer problem to vote on this. That's right. Elizabeth Warren and Jean Jaheen and Maria Cantwell and Kirsten uh, Gillibrand and Claire McCaskill and Amy Klobuchar and Diane Feinstein and Debbie Stabenow and uh, Catherine Cortez Masto and Heidi Heitkamp from a red state yes. who voted no. Thank you, uh, Senator Schumer, for that. But these women, including Kamala, uh, Kamala Harris, and also uh, Maggie Hassan and, of course, uh, Tammy Baldwin. So all of these, in addition to Murkowski and Collins, the women were the, really the ones who led the way here. They got it right. Yeah. Well, all right. I'm glad we, okay. glad we had them. The resistance. The resistance is part of the reason why Collins stood firm, part of the reason why Murkowski stood firm. I don't think that's really what affected McCain's vote. Mm-hmm. And uh, it didn't affect enough of the others, like uh, Heller and Portman and, and Moran, but still. Yes. It made the only reason it was close and stayed as close as it did the... Ah, dealing with the cold. Okay. The entire time was uh, because of the resistance. That's so true. Garthwaite, who is a, uh, a Republican policy wonk, health wonk, talking to fellow Republicans, this palpable anger and McCain's vote. Instead, let's pause and realize the opportunity he's given us. This will go down as one of McCain's great services to the country and party, saving us, us Republicans, we Republicans, he means. Hmm. Our base is worse than things in anger. If we passed the bad bill in this disgusting process, we'd have paved the way for permanent minority status. We've been saved from that. Oh. Well, I hope you're wrong. But now... We face a critical choice to show country whether we're a party capable of governing or perpetuating children. And this should be easy. It starts by refusing calls from the party's darkest corners to continue sabotaging the ACA by sowing uncertainty and spreading lies. Then we need to use the ACA as a base to create a better functioning system that uses markets and respects the limitations. And then, as a society, we need to think about the trade-offs we're willing to accept in order to create and maintain broader coverage. And this is where I turn to my friends across the aisle, many of whom dismiss the meaningful trade-offs universal insurance requires. In the end, both parties must move beyond slogans and confront hard realities, true for drug pricing, delivery, reform, and social insurance. Hmm. Okay? Those of you who are single-payer advocates, you can't have single-payer without giving up something. It's going to cost you. And if you don't acknowledge that, you're not being honest with yourself. It may be something we want to do anyway. Ah, okay. But it's more expensive to do it that way. And so you have to decide where are going to be the trade-offs. Anybody who enters any kind of health care reform discussion without acknowledging that there's going to be trade-offs is going to get into trouble. That's what happened with Obama It did when he said, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. Ah. He never should have said that because it was wrong. Yeah, it only applied to a very small percentage, maybe 3% of the population. But look what happened when he said that. Yes. that's got to acknowledge that. For most people, this is going to help, but then there's going to be these trade-offs. If you are not honest, it's going to come back to bite you. The mm. trouble with Republicans okay. is that they've never been honest about it. They've been lying about the process the entire time. They lied about the Affordable Care Act. They lied about how it was passed. They lied about what it does. They lied about the benefits it gives people. And that came back to bite them because their own constituents said, I don't get what you're saying. I know what it did for me, and I don't want you to be doing what you're doing. And in the end, they wound up listening, but only because McCain enabled them to. Hmm. Very odd, the whole thing. It was very odd. So it, it was a lie, you know, based on, a, you know, it wasn't a, a riddle hidden in an enigma, hidden in a puzzle. You know, it was a lie based yeah. on a fallacy, based on a falsehood. And in the end, what McConnell kept saying is, don't talk about what the bill does. You know why? There isn't a bill. Don't talk about what our plan is. You know why? We don't have a plan. Uh, which whole- is amazing. The whole plan was to use everything as a placeholder so that maybe if we buy ourselves more time, we can get to the point where we actually start thinking about what we're doing. 
And they're trying to do it by the Hastert rule, where only the majority of the majority counts. Yeah. And it doesn't work that way. They don't have a big enough majority in the Senate to do that. And that's not how the Senate has traditionally worked. And so back to regular order, they're going to have to just do it again. And that, my friends, is pretty much a summary of how this whole thing went down. Before I left, I was a little uh, perhaps more optimistic than many of my colleagues uh, that this was not going to work, that, that the health care was not going to pass. And I thought that the, in the end, and I said this before I left, I don't think that the, the uh, moderates are going to fold, meaning uh, Murkowski mm. and Collins. Heller and some of the others were kind of trapped by the rhetoric, but McCain saved them. I guess so. Yeah, the, uh, a lot did, a lot happened in the space of that time. And I will say that, uh, I mean, I, I, I was not as optimistic about their not folding, but boy, did Republicans and Mitch McConnell and others who necessitated his maneuvering make it easy for them not to fold. They, all the problems that caused uh, Collins and Murkowski to want to hold out, both substantive and procedural, got worse as the process went on. And I guess I didn't anticipate that quite as clearly. I, I, I guess I thought that, like traditional uh, lawmakers, the, uh, the they would recognize, the leadership would recognize the need to move closer to the positions of the holdouts to try and coax them in. I know they were worried about balancing these things and losing conservatives by giving away too much, but once it became clear that they were um, trying to do anything that they could to put together the 50 votes and don't worry about what's in this package because we'll fix it in conference, uh, everyone should take note, and, and Murkowski and Collins in particular should take note that during the critical period in which they were assuring, trying to assure anyone who would listen, don't worry about it if it makes you nervous what's in this package. None of it is going to come to fruition anyway. We're going to change it all in conference. It, even with that cover, never any serious effort whatsoever to add or subtract anything that would bring in Murkowski and Collins, but otherwise ordinarily alienate conservatives and then try and run the same illusion on them. Oh, don't worry about it. It'll all be changed in conference. Never a hint that conservatives would have to make any sort of sacrifice whatsoever. And I think that message probably got through to Murkowski and Collins, too. Uh, you know, one, uh, it was the message, we don't regard you as serious Republicans and we're not going to do anything to accommodate you. And two, that, yeah, this conference, even if it does happen, won't happen our way, certainly. Uh, there's been no indication that they're even willing to make conservatives uncomfortable for the 15 minutes it's going to take to get this done. But they're all on our backs. It, so. it is weird. Uh, one of the other things that I think is highly significant that doesn't really get talked about very much, and maybe it did while I was away, is Ron Johnson and some of the other comments that some of the other senators made during this process hmm. to the effect that it turns out McConnell was telling every senator what they wanted to hear yes. and asked them not to go to the public and discuss this. And, and Ron Johnson went to the public and discussed this. Yeah, that and happened. Said, I early. heard that McConnell was telling the people who were worried about Medicaid uh, cuts is that the Medicaid cuts would never happen. Right. That and the first. conservatives who wanted those Medicaid cuts were being told, don't worry, those Medicaid cuts are going to happen. Right. And Ron Johnson said... This is what this is what I heard that he's telling one group of people one thing and another group of people another thing. And I don't trust this guy, McConnell. Yeah. I don't trust my leader because he's telling everybody what they want to hear. How can I vote yes when I don't trust what's really going to happen? And he said it in public. Yeah. And that is highly unusual. Uh, needless to say, not just unusual because a Republican did it. Right. But basically what he's doing is a Ted Cruz calling McConnell a liar. Yes. That's true. And that uh, didn't get the same kind of coverage that Cruz did when Cruz said it, because Cruz said it, you know, in, in terms that you couldn't ignore from the well of the Senate from yeah. on the floor. I don't know if I'm using the right term. But, you know, um, he, he said it in a way that uh, could not be denied because it was in the record. But Ron Johnson gave all of these, you know, for a week he was fuming. Yeah. And he's saying, listen, let me explain to you what's going on here. My leader is lying to us about what this whole process is that, by the way, none of us know because McConnell's writing it in secret. Yep. But I'm voting for it anyway. 
Yeah, that that was the the kicker. I don't really understand how he came around to, but I, I guess he bought into the rhetoric in the end of uh, well. Don't worry about it. All I need is a, a, a yes vote just to keep things going here. I just can't be – we can't have this thing killed. We just right. have to keep looking for opportunities to keep it alive, although right. really, honestly. Uh, ultimately, down. McConnell kept saying to his Republican uh, senators, stupid, don't you understand? It's got nothing to do with policy whatsoever. It's about mm. getting 50 votes. Yeah. And that made them all incredibly uncomfortable. Forget the, best, the fact yeah. that they didn't like the process. Some of them, Originally, a handful yeah. out of the 52, maybe three, actually care about policy. Yeah. And it bothered them that this wasn't about policy. McConnell basically said it's got nothing to do with policy. It's a, it's a, it's a skinny repeal place marker that has nothing to do with policy. It's about getting the 50 votes. Just do it. Yeah. Same thing with the MTP, the, the motion to proceed vote. Yeah. And what made me uncomfortable is watching Republicans who should have said, no, this is nonsense vote. No, there should have been 20 of them. Yeah. And instead there were only three. And, of course, if it had been Democratic legislation, there would have been 52. Yeah. So, this is it, you know, the, the whole process was odd. And, and yeah. then in the end, what really uh, needs to be looked at now, first of all, is do they try again at some point in the future because it always comes back. Yeah, why not? Uh, does this mean that uh, Trump takes everybody at their word and says, OK, it's done now. I'm going to try to sabotage all these individual states uh, because I can. And yes. see what the reaction is of the individual senators like Keller who voted yes. And then does this open up this? Is this the dam breaking? Hmm. If Republicans see that you can't get this done on health care, how are they supposed to do this on tax reform? Don't forget, every loophole that's closed in tax reform is somebody else's business plan. Yes, that's true. And so that means that the, the lobbyists fighting to keep those loopholes open, are going to spend an inordinate amount of money, as much as the Koch brothers do. And so how do you overcome that with a leader that you don't necessarily trust? Not only do you not trust to tell the truth, but now you don't trust to actually get stuff done. Right. The magician is gone. Yeah. So who's the man behind the curtain, and who loves him? Hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, uh, there's been a, a bit of discussion around the edges, too, about whether or not this is the end of McConnell's leadership. I think that they're stuck with him for a while. They can obviously, they can make that they change, but they'll just simply say, we don't need another gigantic, graphic, open defeat for a prominent Republican. We'll all just, we, we weren't listening to him anyway. There's nobody else we're going to listen to, so we might as well not listen to this guy. Right. For the remainder of I mean, you know, Boehner's, Boehner wasn't really threatened as much as he decided to quit because he had had it. And McConnell, this is the position he always wanted. And I think I said this on the show before I left. you got to give him credit for being a good tactician, although he's a terrible strategist. Uh, I guess. I mean, it, at least uh, he was a good tactician for the purpose of getting to the majority leadership after but, that. You know, getting, know. getting to the skinny repeal, it was an idea. Uh, yeah. And yeah. he almost pulled it off. Right. I mean, I guess that's a true. a terrible idea. <laughs> you know, if he had succeeded, he would have failed. That's what I mean about being a terrible strategist. I guess so. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was because it was, it's a legit play to try to make. It's just highly unusual. But then this is one of those things where you just really literally were going to try a, by any means necessary to get across the finish line. And I mean, I've been in that position too. I've come up with ideas that I think the Senate, I can technically make this work, but it's going to put everybody in a really uncomfortable position. It's not always a great place to be. And he's been there and nowhere else for this entire but, but Congress. The thing, you know, in order to pull this off, there has to be some degree of trust. Yes. And I think that trust is gone. The Senate doesn't trust the House. That's why this family yes. didn't trust that uh, Paul Ryan was actually going to have a legitimate conference discussion. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the senators said that. They said, my God, if this skinny thing passes, yeah. my oh, state is doomed. I'm only voting for it on the assumption that Paul Ryan is going to negotiate something with us in conference. It'll come out better, and we're just buying time. But what if that's wrong? What right. if I can't trust Ryan? How am I going to vote for this? And, and uh, at the same time, you have a president it. who does nothing to uh, instill trust in his party, in his proposals, in where he's going. Everybody knows he doesn't give a crap. Yeah. And so he's not going to give you political cover. And even if you vote his way, he's going to turn on you in a moment. There's no such thing as loyalty. 
And if there's no such thing as loyalty, then what am I doing? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I you know, think you're stuck with voting on policy. And if you're voting on policy, this is terrible policy. So, you know, I'm just looking forward to to the future in terms of where the Republicans are supposed to go. We've said on this show for years they don't know how to govern. You know what? They don't know how to govern. And you know mm-hmm. why? Because they don't have any governing philosophy. And they don't have any policies that are popular. And so they don't know what to do. They know what their donors want them to do, but they can't get it done. Yeah. Uh, here's a solution. Uh, yeah. Governor Mike Huckabee tweeting last night, I guess, following the vote. I don't know what he was doing up at 3.30 in the morning. Uh, he says, here's, here's the answer. Time to repeal the 17th Amendment. The founders had it right. Senators chosen by state legislatures. They'll work for their states and respect the 10th, what I think he meant, 10th Amendment, which uh, I always think, I remind everybody it's a real nullity, but, uh, it's a, uh, got cult status among the members of the right. So his, his whole idea is, yeah, uh, all these senators who were responding to the constituents who elected them, that's the real problem. We need people who are. Is, you know, we got to go back to electing senators who only represent white landowning males. Yeah, back in the old days, the women well, got back the in the old days, they didn't they do that. Up. Look at the women in the Senate. Look what they did. Yeah, uh, the, the, this is something that they keep falling back on every time they lose something in the Senate, and I really find it. Uh, I'm not so certain that they do any better. By the way, uh, without the Seventeenth Amendment, you have. In, I, I bet Dean Heller doesn't vote no. Under this, you know, had he been appointed by the Nevada legislature, yeah, I, I doubt very much they would have appointed him either. But supposing they were answerable only to the state legislatures, uh, that would be a very interesting situation. I don't know that they do any better, especially when there are states. Well, what do R- Medicaid expansion state Republicans vote? Under the repeal of the Seventeenth Amendment, how do they how do they cast their vote? This is an enormous amount of money that the state legislature is counting on to make their budget work. I bet they send different instructions than Huckabee thinks. I bet everything goes differently than Huckabee thinks, though. Hmm. Anyway, so the question now becomes: What happens next? Okay. And of course, uh, nobody knows. Answer is recess. But let's just say. Republicans no longer have the big mo. Uh, okay. <laughs> in terms of where they want to go, they all actually have to sit down and work out some fixes with Schumer. There are people which is who why say smiling Mitch McConnell's is. the big mo, but I don't know what that means. So, well, yeah, they've lost their momentum. Certainly, uh, Trump, if he ever had any, and and by the way, if if somebody like Trump ever had any momentum, it's very difficult to stop. Uh, momentum with that kind of mass. It takes a real serious uh, oppositional force, and thankfully it was there. And uh, now he can, yeah, now he can uh, just, consume just, himself. Right. All right. So here's a good piece uh, from uh, Politico magazine: How Congress used to work. The deep roots of Republicans' oh. failure on Capitol Hill by Bruce Bartlett. Always worthwhile remembering how it used to be, because sometimes that's a model for where we could go. After oh, all, David, you and I are just so conservative. Right. We like elected senators. This is a really interesting, my last piece before I go in my uh, special edition here, because my voice is giving out. But this is uh, a piece by Peggy Noon, which is quite interesting. Really? It's called Trump is Woody Allen without the humor. Uh Tweets show utter weakness. They're plaintive, shrill little cries, usually just after dawn. But that's the humor. All right. The president's primary problem as a leader is not that he is impetuous, brash, or naive. It's not that he's an experienced, crude, or an outsider. It's that he is weak and sniveling. How? Oh. It is that he undermines himself almost daily by ignoring traditional norms and forms of American masculinity. Uh. Uh, I mean, remember, this is a Republican woman telling the president, you're a wimp. He's not strong and self-controlled, not cool and tough, not low-key and determined. He's whiny, weepy, and self-pitying. He throws himself sobbing on the body politic. He's a drama queen. It was once said sarcastically of George H.W. Bush that he reminded everybody of her first husband. Trump must remind people of their first wife. Actually, his wife Melania is tougher than he is with her stoicism and grace, her self-discipline and desire to show the world respect by presenting herself with dignity. 
Half the presidents tweet show utter weakness. I know this is nonsense, but it's just it's amazing that yes. Republicans are saying this out loud. All right. Uh, for that reason, I will accept it. I will say uh, this is, it's well, great to hear I mean, the president just, criticized by a Republican, but Peggy Noonan is out of her gourd. Right. You All know, right. And, uh, assuming that, uh, you know, assuming that. <laughs> yes. Just that she, here he, she is saying in public what most of them are thinking in private. He's a jerk. He's an idiot. He's weak. Yeah. And uh, no reason why I should fear him. I'll agree with all of those things. Your underlying reasoning is garbage, but okay. Yeah, the underlying reasoning is garbage, but the point is saying it out loud. And once you say it out loud and the emperor has no clothes, a lot of the rest follows. Oh, my God. I just thought about that. No, well, you know, take that out of your mind. Once um, once he cannot be unseen, but still. What happens now with tax reform? What happens now with infrastructure? What happens now with any of their so-called priorities? It, uh, I don't know. It's all uh, don't infrastructure. Have, why do you need over? Him? And why isn't impeachment on the table? David Ignatius is writing in the Washington Post today, time to think about the unthinkable. Yeah. Uh, Ross Doubt Hat, uh, wearing his Doubt Hat once again, uh, wrote the other day, yeah, this president should not be president, whatever it takes to get rid of this guy. This is, it's good news. I like that. You're starting to hear those voices, and they're not from Democrats who have been saying this since the day after he was elected. Mm-hmm. It's now coming from Republicans who are establishment pillars, as yes. we say in the trade. And uh, and Doubt Hat. Yeah. Who's just there. But, yeah. yeah. Uh, Brooks is, is probably at, you know, at the salad bar at Applebee's for all we know. <laughs> well, we'll have to wait for a lot of others to, to catch up, but it is being... It's being mentioned. That's a good thing. Uh, I think uh, it's been pointed out also that uh, the failure of this health care ridiculousness will, of course, will make it more much more difficult on tax reform. And, and those two things taken together, at some point, Republicans are going to, you know, say, mm-hmm. all right, well, we know he shouldn't be president, but we did think we were going to get Obamacare repeal and tax reform out of it. And if we're not, then he's just a crazy a hole, and, and there's no reason to have him around. And 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 I mean, Mitch McConnell already, I think, gave away the store. Well, Gorsuch. Well, okay, but that's done. What else have you got for me? I, I'm going to need to see like two, three more uh, Supreme Court retirements. Right, and the more worth. crazy Trump is, the less likely they are yeah. to retire. Let me just finish by reading you just some headlines from the Washington Post today. All right. Senate rejects health care law repeal. Trump GOP leaders suffer major setback. The night John McCain killed the GOP's health care fight. Trump hardball tactics backfire. Senator Murkowski will not be bullied. Uh, a, tri- a trifecta of criticism for President Trump with this message. Change your behavior as if that's going to happen. Trump's bizarre communication strategy. That's not even talking about the mooch. Some GOP lawmakers dare to publicly defy Trump as frustration mounts. The king is mad. That's by Eugene Robinson. Well, uh, Ronald Rotunda, the president can be indicted, just not by Mueller. And David oh. Ignatius is start, time to start thinking about the unthinkable, which is... What's that one? Really oh, maybe so, that, send me that uh, Rotunda bit. Uh, okay, That's I will. Interesting. Uh, I should at least way, study be at the bottom of the Skype list. And with that, uh, I will sign off and say thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, having me on for this uh, special uh, uh, session here. And uh, if you ever have a chance to go to Iceland, folks, uh, go. It's really great. Okay. All right. Take care, we'll and I now. will uh, uh, await your uh, decision on what happens on Monday. Yes. But otherwise, I'll I'll be there either Monday or Wednesday, depending upon when your next show is. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm glad we were able to fit this in because it was a momentous news, and there was the possibility we wouldn't even be able to do this on Monday. I'll update everybody on that. But, yes, okay. thanks very much, Greg. Take care, and I'll talk to you. All right. You take care. Uh, tape dollars to your door or whatever we're supposed to do. Stones in the pocket. <laughs> which, yeah. round, which one do you have? Do you got the rocks in the I, pocket I have one? the, no, ten stones in your pocket. I'm already yeah. seven, you know, out. All I right. only need three more uh, stones to go. <laughs> Thank God. Okay. Well. So my book will be back by next week. Take care. Very good. Thank you. You do the same. Uh, everybody go to Iceland. Uh, and, and if we all go to Iceland, then we could probably just do one live show there and uh, tape that together. Or maybe we could just uh, skip the show entirely and we all go, I don't know, snowmobiling or something like that. Is that a season for snowmobiling? How would I rate the overall quality of this call? This one was excellent. 
Um, it, the problems that we had at the beginning of the show, I think, lie elsewhere. So uh, that's good. I never did get out to uh, see if I can summon my uh, son off of his computer to bring me my water bottle. I should have had that at the, the desk today, and I forgot that that was clearly the problem. That's what messed up all of the computers. I'm very interested, though, now in this new uh, piece that that uh, Greg sent at the end. Let's open it up. The president can be indicted, just not by Mueller. I'm curious to see what mechanism uh, Ronald Rotunda has in mind. The new Skype, uh, let me review this. They didn't ask me for my review of the new Skype. They asked me, how did the call go? The call went fine. The rest of Skype sucks. Eh, it doesn't. It's fine. Uh, a lot of people are down on Skype. Uh, I find it helpful because it's free, and uh, up until last week, I knew how to use it, and so did Greg. I don't know if Greg had to update his Skype or not, um, but like all updates, it's it's stuff that no doubt in the Skype offices they said, oh, this is an obvious improvement. Everyone will love this, except, you know, there's always some users somewhere. Well, there's always users everywhere who are like, I like it the old way. You like it the way you like it. Right. So all the new Im- improved things, it actually makes it a little bit more difficult for us to use for these discussions. Uh, their big improvement was it used to be that in the in the text chat that can accompany our audio phone calls, Greg was able to send me links to the stories he was talking about. And he can still do that, but it would come across as text. He would say, uh, here's a story I'm reading. Uh, in the Washington Post, and he would send me the text, and you would see the URL, you know, HTTP, blah, 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 www.washingtonpost.com. And occasionally in the URLs, they made it obvious uh, whose column it was or the title of the column was in there. So he would mention it, and I could see which link he was talking about very quickly. The new big improvement is now if you send the link, right, it takes the URL, and it it scrapes the web for uh, other data that it can include about the story and converts it from the straight text URL into a little thumbnail uh, with a photo, whatever photo was illustrating the piece online. Now the photo gets presented and the headline is run. They superimpose it over part of the photo in you know it's in white text so it's supposed to pop out a little but it doesn't always work with the photo so now i'm see i have a bunch of photos and the photos are big and they take up considerably more column inches so that in the space where i now have two or you know almost one and a half photos with headlines superimposed over them with an indication of where the uh, links came from. So I can see Politico, I can see Washington Post. So unless he reads me the title and it's on my screen, I can't find it. So I go scrolling in the space of uh, that I've got on my screen, I can fit one and a half of these thumbnails. So in other words, two of what is sometimes 15, 20 or more links that Greg sends. And if he sends an excerpt from the piece that's several paragraphs long even fewer links would appear and so you know he mentions the story if he skips around i'm like oh, which one of the 15 pictures and they all have the same picture and as you're scrolling the, the type is very small it's actually made things very difficult it looks beautiful but you can't really use it for a quick reference list it's certainly not greg's fault no i don't want to change anything about the way he's doing that uh, but uh, I'll say that I missed the way the old Skype handled those things. And uh, it's a new, improved look, and it's beautiful, and I'm sure there's a lot of people who really love it. And uh, I'm one of the rare users who really had uh, good reason to want it to come across as text only. I wonder if there's a setting. There might be a setting somewhere. This is usually the case that uh, that you can use to uh, just say, yeah, don't convert the URLs into those thumbnails and I'm just not a skilled enough user to find it. And if I were to call the help desk at Skype, they'd roll their eyes and say, come on, please. It's under uh, preferences, uh, settings, visual, video, conversion, the, the, you know, go into the 19th menu down, which we know inside out because we programmed it. And you dummy, why didn't you find it? Anyway, so I'm done with that. That's the complaint section. That's the Woody Allen section of, uh, Today's uh, review of our communications applications. 
I gotta say once again, before I even check out the much more interesting uh, Ron Rotunda piece, uh, yeah, see, I, I want to go back to the Peggy Noonan thing, and I can't find it because wh- which picture did they use? Ah, oh, there it is. It is the cartoon uh, rendering of the uh, of, of Mount Rushmore with some. What's his name? With with uh, Trump on there, too. I already had it open. I should have just used that. So uh, Peggy Noonan is an idiot, and I can't stand her. And uh, a lot of people lo- uh, people love to make the little drinky, drinky motion whenever Peggy Noonan is on. I don't know. Is she a drunk? Does anybody know that for sure? She certainly writes like she is. Uh, she's horrible. I, 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 no, nothing certainly against Greg for bringing it up. It served a very specific purpose, and he readily acknowledges. She, she's out of her mind. The point is that... Even Republicans and Republicans who are out of their mind, like, and Trump's out of his mind. So, you know, maybe, maybe that's, uh, maybe they should have a closer, closer affinity, these two. But okay, for whatever reason, America has been hoodwinked into believing that Peggy Noonan is representative of some faction of conservative thought. And maybe those people will now become convinced that Trump has to go. So, okay, if there's any value in that, uh, we'll take it. But uh, look at what she's saying here. I mean, first of all, I, I'm guessing that Peggy Noonan, clearly not a fan of Woody Allen's, but Trump is Woody Allen without the humor. Are we certain that she had any idea what the humor of Woody Allen was all about? As she, it sounds like the things that made Woody Allen funny, uh, at least in the classics that he Put out, and I know there's a lot of people who now will refuse to uh, acknowledge that he's done that because, uh, well, you know, there's reasons to criticize him in his personal life. I don't, I, 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 I'm not that good at working out those contradictions. But uh, okay, so you know, things that that had, Woody Allen had going for him with his with his humor was all of this stuff that Peggy Noonan finds so grating. I'm not certain that she ever got it in the first place. Uh, then of course, what else? Yeah, just other things like, uh, what this, uh, oh, it was once said sarcastically of George H.W. Bush that he reminded everyone of her first husband. Trump must remind people of their first wife. And I don't know what that, am I supposed to think that, is that sexist? What, what is that? Am I supposed to think that it's not? What is Trump? Uh, I, I don't have, I mean, I have only a first wife, so I guess I can't make the comparison, but I, I can, I think I can empathize. I think I can understand what that's supposed to mean. And it just doesn't work for me in any sense. Uh, his wife Melania is tougher than he is with her stoicism and grace. I guess, I don't know. I'm not even certain that's true. I don't know whether it's stoicism or she doesn't, doesn't, uh, still, is still un- uncomfortable with her accent and her English. Or doesn't want to talk to people, or we're all beneath her. I can't tell whether that's stoicism, grace, self-discipline, anything. You can't tell a damn thing about Melania. But I, it's not hard to believe that any one individual person is a better person than Donald Trump. He's so horrible. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, so I guess I won't go any further into it except to say that, uh, I don't know, more proof that Peggy Noonan doesn't know what she's doing and I can't believe she gets paid what she gets paid. And I don't even know what she gets paid. The point is she gets paid and that's bad. We should not have that in this country. All right. Uh, do we want to go any further with that? I think not. Let's see. How about some comments from listeners? Michael Musson uh, this morning says that uh, Trump wasn't responsible for the health care fiasco in the Senate, that's all on McConnell. <clears throat> um, I'll agree with that in front of some audiences and blame Trump in, some, in front of other audiences. How about that? Would that be a reasonable thing to do? Trump obviously didn't have much to do with um, the success or failure. Uh, I mean, had it succeeded, of course, he would have claimed all the credit. And he's, I'm sure, happy to shed all of the blame that he can and put it on McConnell. And for that reason, I would like to blame Trump for it. <clears throat> but uh, the president has a role in any legislation, even if it's ignoring the role that they're supposed to play in any in the passage of any legislation. This was supposed to be one of his top priorities, and he did nothing. Um, he didn't know how to do anything but threaten 
He certainly didn't know how to make any deals. He certainly, certainly didn't have any idea what to do on policy. Uh, that seems plain. So in, I would say this, uh, in, in, when we're looking for, if you're looking to find responsibility for Trump to shoulder in this fiasco, I would say it starts and maybe ends with his complete lack of any understanding of the policy and complete lack of understanding of any of the, 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 uh, process for getting something, anything done, certainly something like this done. So it starts with him being on the campaign trail saying, yeah, it's going to be so easy. We're going to have such beautiful health care. It's going to be terrific. We're going to do something great. It's going to lower prices. Everybody's going to be paying $1 a month for excellent health care, the best in the world. And it's going to be so easy. All I'm gonna, We're just going to have to wave our wand and it's gone. And of course, he misunderstood all of that, misunderstood the policy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, he left it largely to McConnell. And certainly the way this particular thing fell apart has a lot to do. Well, uh, well it exposed a lot of McConnell's myth and weakness. Um, and it didn't have to. I mean, but this process could have ended a lot earlier. I would say the responsibility that Trump bears here is that he never had a realistic vision of what was what could happen and he never had any any vision at all about what should happen in its place obamacare uh and 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 that certainly made things worse and then of course just his continuing demand that they do things anyway i'm not certain whether mcconnell's preference would have been to abandon this earlier or not but I think it was, and I think he felt compelled to continue on by pressure from Trump, which must have irked him because he surely knows that Trump doesn't have any idea what he's doing or what he's talking about. And the fact that, you know, he's going to suggest to me what the Senate ought to be wasting its time on, honestly, is ridiculous. But he went ahead and did it anyway. But I, you know, I don't know if I, I don't, I certainly don't want to spare anybody any blame. What else do we have here? Uh, Michael also comments that McCain's not a maverick. That's true. He's just a stubborn a-hole. I'll believe that. That, uh, he writes in response to, what's it got here? An embedded tweet from, uh, Astid, Astid W. Herndon. Do I even have any idea who that is? Uh, I don't. National politics at the Boston Globe. Okay. Well, uh, uh, that's, that's good. He's got a, he's illustrating his, uh, account with an odd photo. Somebody else, clearly, uh, a bald guy with a tattoo on his head, uh, uh, Tottenham till I die. I guess a soccer fan. Uh, National Politics at the Washington Globe, Astrid Herndon writing, don't write a McCain as a Maverick story without acknowledging that Murkowski and Collins were the principled no votes from the jump. Good night. Okay, and that is an excellent point, uh, Michael, uh, just piling on there to say McCain's not a maverick. Don't even write that story, uh, I guess, in the first instance because he's not a maverick. But also, as Herndon says here, uh, yeah, even if you do think he's a maverick, the credit goes to Murkowski and Collins who did the right thing from the start. And I'll agree with that. Uh, I like that line of thinking. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, how far I would carry it because honestly, I'm not that proud of Murkowski and Collins either, but okay. Uh, they certainly did better than, than McCain did. And it is perverse that McCain would get so much of the, uh, attention for it because of course he's not the deciding vote without Collins and Murkowski standing firm. But, uh, hmm. I don't know. There's certainly, and there's certainly something to be said for, uh, pausing and giving some consideration to the possibility that the focus is on McCain because sexism. Although I'm not a hundred percent convinced that that's absolutely the case. I mean, other things set this up. Now, McCain is, of course, somebody who's done an awful lot in his political career to make sure that he's in the place 
the right place at the right time to be considered either the big martyr or the big hero. And Murkowski uh, and Collins don't often play that role, although Collins has done a pretty good job of making a career out of being a last holdout. And, but, but, you know, even having given herself all those opportunities, she hasn't come away with the same sort of, like, she hasn't come away with the maverick title that McCain did, and McCain wasn't really even the maverick that he claimed to be. Uh, and so I'm, but, uh, you know, maybe it all comes back to the sexism question. Like, maybe a, a woman senator either can't because the press in its, you know, uh, uh, assignation of gender roles and or uh, insistence on its sexism uh, will refuse to allow any woman to claim that kind of role for herself or maybe she's just not particularly good at it and uh, and and McCain for some reason has the formula for how to do it I don't know uh, it's entirely possible that the, the right woman with the right combination of Skills, if you want to call it skills, you know, just setting yourself up as a, as a legend when you're not. I don't know how, what a great skill that really is. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know how much of it to assign to sexism and I'll leave that to the academics, I guess, but uh, there's certainly an element of it in there and it really ought to be mentioned. And I'm glad that enough people have mentioned it that it's reached my, that it's gotten my attention so that I can point to it. What else have we got here? <clears throat> Kate Sherrill, uh, pointing out from Matt Purse, and I'm still guessing at the pronunciation of his name, Republicans currently control 32 state legislatures. So I'm assuming Huckabee wants this because it would mean 64 Republican senators. Uh, yeah, that's likely why he wants it. That's why, oh, that's absolutely why he wants it. That's, that's the only reason they'd be behind it and they would be for passing the 17th Amendment again the next time that changes. Uh, I only point out that I'm not certain that 64 Republican senators who are appointed by their state legislatures arrive in Washington with a common and centralized loyalty to the National Republican Party and or Donald Trump. I think that they probably arrive with, uh, well, I, I, Historically, I think the loyalty was obviously much closer to the to the membership of the state's legislatures that had appointed them. Because as I as I recall, I don't I don't know uh, I didn't I haven't studied this issue, but in passing, in just reviewing various uh, bits and pieces of Senate history, I think that there was a lot more tolerance for the recall of senators during the period prior to the adoption of the 17th Amendment and that state legislatures were given much more latitude than, say, voters are given now. It's very difficult and still an open question whether or not federal law permits the voters of a state to hold a valid recall election for a sitting senator. They uh, have had recall elections for governors where it's simply a matter of state law, but where there's that interaction between the voters in a state and the federal government, the, the, I don't think any courts have been able, have been willing to entertain the validity of a recall election of a federal official. And... I think it was much, uh, I, I, the outcome may be different now, now that there's been that question and we have settled it in the context of elected senators. Were they to somehow magically revert back and repeal the 17th Amendment and have senators appointed by state legislatures, um, they might have to change recall jurisprudence or, or they may review things and say, yeah, uh, Back before the 17th Amendment, in those days, we had a different view in the courts of recalls and the relationship between the federal government and the state government. And we mistakenly, the, the earlier courts permitted uh, legislatures to recall their senators at will. And we really ought not, for the sake of stability, to, con to allow that to ha continue to happen or to revert to that behavior. But uh, 
anyway, I, I guess the issue here is uh, they they certainly kept a tighter rein on their senators at the state legislative level. And uh, Huckabee makes probably a good gamble to the extent that, you know, he has any coherent theory behind it besides I wish I was winning more often. Um, in, in that a lot of those legislatures that are controlled by Republicans are controlled largely by Republicans who wish they were national Republicans and wanted to get into politics originally. They're, they're in the state legislature now because those people consider it a path to the federal legislature and they get to run for Congress eventually. Um, there's not a whole lot of them that are really super concerned these days about uh, managing the state's affairs and only the state's affairs and would be happy to retire from office having served X number of years in the state legislature and they can quietly go back to their businesses or whatever afterwards. Lots of them do by necessity because there's just not enough jobs available on the federal level for them and only the most successful and manipulative of them get to move on. But uh, uh, at least back in the olden days, it would be a lot uh, easier to envision Republican senators arriving in Congress and being prevailed upon to repeal Obamacare only to be contacted by their state legislatures to say, yeah, you know, that's where the National Party is, but we were counting on X number of dollars coming in from the federal government. We're going to balance our budget based on that, and I can't really fathom how we do without it. And so as much as the president wants you to repeal this thing, we want you to not repeal this thing. It would be tough to figure out exactly how it would happen, how it would go. But that, that's okay. I'm willing to let, uh, you know, Huckabee sit there and pronounce himself a, a visionary for uh, rolling back the 17th Amendment. We'll never do it. So uh, he gets to sit there and, and theorize about it from in, in irrelevance. And I'll just leave him there from now on. Michael also comments here, it's hard to... Recall your senator when they are so bland and unmemorable. Yeah, well, that does make things difficult. Like, for instance, uh, Senator, what's his name, from uh, Alaska? Was it Sullivan? I can't even remember now. It's only been 10, 15 minutes since we talked about him. Let's see. Uh, Mad Hatter commenting some time ago, I can't wait for Murkowski to summon Zinke before her committee. She also controls his funding. That's going to be, that's true. Uh, Zinke, a member of the House, never really experienced, and not even for that long, never really experienced what it was like to, uh, to, you know, to be called out before a Senate committee where the terms are so much longer and the chairs that much more powerful and the committees are smaller and the members of the committees are more tightly knit than in the House. I don't think he knew what he was getting into. He just was doing Trump's bidding and now it's going to, now it's going to make life uncomfortable for him, doubly so, because Murkowski is going to come down on him like a ton of bricks. And then Trump will come down on him like a ton of bricks because he's not getting anything done. And he's not getting anything done because Zinke was dumb enough to listen to Trump in the first place uh, to take the job and in the second place to try to threaten Murkowski. And, uh, well, it might not work out very well for him. All right, let's see. Uh, well, what other uh, comments do I need to round up here? Uh, Greg mentioning, uh, let's see, she called, uh, okay, I guess uh, is Greg's pointing to John Aravosis. Aravosis is pointing to the Peggy Noonan story and saying, well, she called Trump limp. And so it is therefore a must read. And it's, it's good in terms of getting under his skin. I'm sure that those are the, those are the sorts of insults that do get under his skin. And I guess I should confess, I mean, I very frequently will do and say things about Trump that I ordinarily wouldn't say uh, so easily about other people, including uh, various forms of uh, really uh, unacceptable insults, because I know it'll get under his skin. Even though it's a progressive no-no, uh, I know it'll bother him. And unfortunately, along the way, it also bothers progressive allies and they are right to complain about it and i should point those things out um so maybe she's just uh, uh running an exercise like that for conservatives but i doubt it. she's also very dumb and, and not a very good analyst okay greg also pointing out here what else does he send me peter Ducey's tweet if i were mitch mcconnell i would resign representative mo brooks 
tells me about last night's Obamacare repeal and replace flop in the Senate. Mo Brooks having quite a moment for himself these days. Uh, Brian, Brian Monroe, Canadian pundit, who tweets as Canuck pundit. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, he says, uh, remember this quote? We're going to win so much you're going to get tired of winning. That's right. Not quite. Not exactly how it worked out. Thank you for reminding me of that one. Bill in Portland, Maine. I never did read your morning tweet this morning, did I? Uh, I think because I was having such a panic attack over getting all the apps running. But uh, worth noting, he says, that McCain's no vote is the one that made McConnell's head explode. And, and you know, we're thankful for that. Absolutely true. McConnell had already gotten over the Collins... Murkowski things. And, and maybe that's part of it, too. I mean, I guess we're, as long as we're trying to figure out what factors into the press handing the credit to McCain, although I, I have to note, I mean, the reason I know, uh, the reason I'm I'm aware of the situation enough to say, hey, shouldn't Murkowski and Collins be getting more of the credit is because of the number of members of the press, good ones, uh, that maybe don't get as much attention in other circles, but certainly get lots of attention in our circles, are writing that. So when I say, well, the members of the press, they're all sexist, and they're doing this thing to uh, write Collins and Murkowski out of the history because of that sexism, that's only partially true, and it's not true of the the, the significant portion of the members of the uh, mainstream media, the traditional media, who have been so clear in saying that, Credit belongs properly to Murkowski and Collins that even I have noticed it. So let's at least put that one out there. Uh, but yes, uh, also explaining part of the um, uneven distribution of credit is McConnell's head was never going to explode based on Murkowski's vote or Collins's vote because he writes them off all the time, or at least wrote them off throughout most of this process. And he thought he could win McCain and McCain enjoyed saying no and uh, that exploded both McConnell's heads and probably Trump's head as well and uh, that's a good thing so okay here's some additional credit for that Eh, thank you for pointing that out Bill that's absolutely right Greg's got another comment I think I'm way behind in comments Richard Painter commenting again and he's been a big name in the last couple of days. At this point, Dems could pass universal coverage, single payer, et cetera, and call it the Donald Trump Makes America Great Again Act, and he'd sign it. And I think that is not true, but I think it's a good point. And uh, it might be that he would sign almost anything. That's a possibility. And, and he would try to claim credit for it or say it was his idea. I mean, he may very well. You would absolutely see Donald Trump out there saying, not many people know this, but there are other countries where there's only a single payer for health care. We don't, we don't do that in this country. We don't know why. Because our politicians are stupid. Everybody else has figured out. The rest of the world is paying for health care beautifully this way. And the United States, because of our idiot politicians, are not doing it. And I, it occurred to me one night, I'm watching the television, and I'm thinking, how many payers should we have in this country for health? Because right now we have like a trillion or something like that. And so if we could just narrow it down to a single payer, that would obviously be more economical. And not many people have ever had this idea. I think I'm the first one. I think I thought of it myself. And so I'm going to suggest that now, even though it's already written down here on this paper, and uh, it's in largely, it almost looks like a giant book. It's got so many pages of details about how to do it. I don't even remember writing this, but I am going to sign it because it's my idea. He might go for that. By the way, speaking of the idea of passing universal coverage or single payer or any other fun things like that, uh, I did notice that uh, when Republicans were casting about for something, anything, to be a placeholder, don't worry about what's going in this uh, so-called bill at this point. It's just a vehicle to get to conference. If you disagree with skinny repeal, if any part of it worries you and you can't uh, abide by its becoming law, don't worry. Just vote for it and we'll go to conference and change it. Now, you know, we spent a good long time yesterday explaining why there was no particular reason to believe there was ever going to be a conference. There's no certainly no guarantee. There was lots of 
political reasoning going on, and some of it was pretty good. That the ordinarily left to their own devices, lots of members of, say, the House Freedom Caucus might not have accepted skinny repeal as the final uh, final answer for what they were going to give the president to sign. But they, I, I worried yesterday, and I think rightly, that uh, the situational politics were such that they might, in fact, find that something was better than nothing. And if at least 20 or so of the House Freedom Caucus's 40 or so members thought that that was the case or could become convinced that, that was the case, then the other 20 become irrelevant. And you say, all right, well, 20 of you get to be stalwart holdouts and say, I only accept uh, root and branch total repeal, so I voted no. But the thing passed anyway, and something happened, and Republicans claim victory. And as we know, Donald Trump would have ha- you know, hung his hat on anything that got passed, just as you said, or as Richard Painter claimed anyway. Um, but it was interesting to me to note, and, and we kind of hinted at it when we were talking about the way McConnell handled his holdouts who sometimes get labeled moderates, Murkowski and Collins, that there was no effort to move toward them in order to get their, get the 50th vote that they needed to get to conference. And then uh, there was uh, a steadfast effort to make sure that no conservatives ever got upset about what was in the package that was supposed to just be a placeholder. Likewise, you know, they weren't going to get any votes for it out of Democrats, so there was very little use in doing this. But <clears throat> if you were trying to figure out what to do, at some point during the afternoon, by the way, when they were putting together this so-called skinny repeal package, they tried to tailor it so narrowly that they ended up um, at one point missing the necessary budget savings in order to qualify as a reconciliation bill. Remember that they had to, uh, I guess the interpretation these days is that you have to meet or exceed not only what the instructions say you have to save, although again, I'm getting very annoyed at the way the instructions are being rewritten and reinterpreted every time we bring a reconciliation bill here. But I guess the current interpretation is you have to meet or exceed at least what the other house did. Cause I think the instructions were for saving a hundred billion dollars over 10 years in the Senate. And, uh, the, the house bill, I think made it past that and did something like 133 billion in savings. And, and so that was the number that got used that the Senate had to meet the 133 billion, not just they couldn't come in at 120 billion and then conference out that difference. It wouldn't have qualified as a reconciliation bill had that been the case. Anyway, their first attempt at putting out the skinny repeal thing apparently only resulted in about $78 billion in savings. Only $78 billion. Um, but therefore didn't qualify as a reconciliation bill and wouldn't have passed with 50 votes. And they had to go back to the drawing board and come up with some additional pain to inflict on people just to qualify as reconciliation. But, uh, uh, correctly noted, and I think Armando was among the people who correctly noted it. You know what would have done the trick here? If you really just need a placeholder and hey, don't worry about what it says because it's not going to say that once we get through with conference and you need an extra couple hundred billion dollars in order to qualify as reconciliation. How about a gigantic tax increase on billionaires? That would certainly qualify, right? It would balance out. There would be budgetary savings, so to speak. There would be a budgetary advantage, certainly to a gigantic, make it like 99% tax on uh, all income. If you really want to, I mean, what's the difference, right? Why am I trying to craft policy? Uh, uh, 99% tax on all income over a million dollars a year. I know that there will be people for whom that's entirely unfair. There's always somebody, right? Just like there's always somebody who doesn't like the new update on Skype for their own personal reasons. Somebody's not going to like that. Don't worry about it. It's unfair. I admit that. It's going to change in conference. What's the difference? You know, you'll have Republicans say, I can't vote for a tax increase. Sure you can. What's the difference? It's going to come out in conference. It's just a vehicle. No effort whatsoever made to do that. Not that that would have attracted any Republican votes. But it, it is interesting that uh, they made certain that the conservative position was well guarded and they would make no attempt whatsoever or only halting attempts at trying to bring in the 50th, 51st, and 52nd votes that they would have needed 
by making some major concessions. And maybe they couldn't make any concessions that didn't put a further dent in the budget savings. I don't know. But they didn't even try. So McConnell or uh, Markowski and uh, Collins should should keep that in mind. There's going to be no movement toward them on anything where they where their votes are necessary. And in uh, other policy making, I mean really the rest of the year is going to be about uh, dealing with regular regular order 60 votes necessary to invoke cloture on the legislation being considered and uh, I, I probably even less likelihood of moving toward Murkowski or Collins even if they hadn't pissed off the National Republican Party such as it is in the Trump uh, age. Uh, with their votes here. So I don't know. It's going to be a long, tough year for the rest of them. Let's see. What other comments have we here? Uh, Thelonious with the Huckabee trying to stay relevant. He left Fox propaganda to run for president, got crushed in the primaries, and now has nothing to do. Did they never take him back? Interesting. Too bad about that. Uh, Let's see. What else? Uh, Michael with more commentary here. Trump called for single payer a couple months ago. Oh, yeah, that's right. He did by accident in one of his rambling appearances with a foreign leader. He, he has even, I think, more often than just that one time. He he's occasionally said, yeah, maybe single payer wouldn't be such a bad idea. That's that's true. You might get him to fall into that. Uh, is this the reference? Trump admits single payer system provides better health care than we something. We something. And then it goes to Vanity Fair. Uh huh. All right. Well, let's just we'll open that up just for the for the record there. And uh, something lastly here from Greg from NBC News. I see it mentions McConnell. A low moment for McConnell. As for Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, last night's defeat is probably as low of a moment as we can remember for him. Don't be surprised if the health care process, no hearings, no subcommittee work. No committee work, period, really. No regular order cost him capital with his fellow Republican senators who might demand more input in running the Senate GOP ship. Yes, they might, but they also will likely shy away from it because it's hard work and it's difficult and uh, they don't really want to do it. They just want their way. And this is a good opportunity to le- try and leverage their way. Okay, let's see. Uh, what, what was I just opening up? Uh, Trump admits single payer system provides better health care than we do. They couldn't fit the do in there or do we, I don't know. Was that just a typo? Anyway, Bernie Sanders literally broke out laughing when he heard is the subheader here. Abigail Tracy writing this from the May 5th, 2017 edition of Vanity Fair. So, uh, not that long ago, like, uh, just a couple of months, just hours after Donald Trump hosted House Republicans at the White House to celebrate voting to strip health care benefits for millions of people. Oh, this was right after the, the House vote. The president acknowledged that a single-payer system delivers better results. Interesting. Right now, Obamacare is failing, Trump declared during a meeting with Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull uh, in New York on Thursday evening. Oh, I should have used the voice. We have a failing health care. I shouldn't say this to our great gentleman and my friend from Australia because you have better health care than we do. Even that doesn't make any goddamn sense. While Trump said that the Republican passed health care legislation is a very good bill right now and that the United States is en route to having fantastic health care, Trump, whether wittingly or not, praised a universal health care system that, not unlike Obamacare, is government funded partly through taxes on the wealthy. The irony of Trump applauding universal health care on the same day that House Republicans passed a Republican GOP alternative to Obamacare that will cut nearly $1 trillion in taxes for high-income households and cover approximately 24 million fewer people was not lost on Bernie Sanders, a longtime advocate of a single-payer system. The Vermont senator literally, literally broke out in laughter during an interview on MSNBC after host Chris Hayes informed him of the president's remarks. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, do I have a Bernie Sanders voice? Uh, it's a, I only can say it's a huge disaster. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Chris, the president has just said it. That's great, Sanders said gleefully, suggesting that Trump could also take a look at the Canadian and European health care systems. Thank you, Mr. President. Let's move to a Medicare for all system that does what every other major country on earth does, guarantee health care to all people at a fraction of the cost per capita that we spend. All right. 
Well, you know, it didn't go anywhere, but there's an update at the bottom here. Uh, Deputy White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders clarified Friday, way back when in May, that she thought Trump was simply being complimentary of the prime minister. And I don't think it was much more than that. Well, it's an awfully dumb way of doing it. Shortly afterward, Trump himself muddied the waters yet again, tweeting that everybody has better health care than the United States, but that our health care will soon be great. Well, that's par for the course. I don't know. Uh, uh, we could validate Sarah Sanders, Huckabee Sanders's uh, view of things by saying there's very little chance that Donald Trump has any idea what he was talking about, as always in this situation, but um, I'm sure he was trying to be complimentary, but what the hell does he care about being complimentary? He hung up on Turnbull before. I don't know how how much he cares about complimenting the guy, Uh, but someone probably told him afterwards that we're allies, and oh, yeah, I guess I'm supposed to be kinder, and plus, face-to-face, he's a lot less tough than he is on the phone or at a distance where there's no contact whatsoever, Um, but it's it's par for the course in basically his go-to commentary on everything. I mean, the guy's the president of the United States. He shouldn't be saying anything like this. As candidate for president, he shouldn't be saying anything like this. But his go-to phrase, his go-to platform, like with most Republicans, and again, this is a great opportunity to point out, he's not very different from mainstream Republicans. They all campaign on America is a hellhole as a platform, which is incredible to me that you can get any votes like that. You are aware you're running for, you know, office in the United States, right? And you're talking to Americans. I don't know why it resonates with conservative Americans to get out there and say, America is terrible. We have no jobs. The pl- There's no refuge from mass murderers who want to torture you. All of your beautiful, beautiful 15 and 16 year old daughters will be tortured to death. There's no chance you're going to get any kind of a job. What have you got to lose? Your schools are terrible. You're going to be murdered. You have no chance at getting work. Taxes, we have the largest, the highest taxes in this country of anywhere in the world. It's a total mess, believe me. But I'll make it good. How will you do it? I don't know. We're going to have a beautiful plan. It's going to be so easy. How did that win? I really... That's the most distressing thing of all, is that people said, yeah, I agree that we're the worst country in the world, but thank God we're the best country in the world, because otherwise, how do you reconcile this? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I guess if everybody's on meth, it could happen. So maybe that's why we need to address the opioid crisis uh, after all. Oh, okay, let's see some auto-playing video in the background. Thanks to HuffPost, whose story I opened, a uh, piece by Jonathan Cohn uh, earlier, um, that uh, I think uh, sums things up nicely, early in the morning piece here. Obamacare is alive because it has made life better for millions. Republicans could never admit this, and it came back to haunt them. This might be a great way to summarize the whole damn thing. The Affordable Care Act has survived yet another effort to snuff it out, and one reason is a simple reality that Republicans have rarely been willing to admit to their supporters, to the general public, and perhaps even to themselves. It turns out Obamacare has made life better for a great many people. Side note, could we have done better? Could we have made life better for more people? Made life even better even for a smaller number of people with a different formulation? Maybe. Certainly uh, a possibility. But we have what we have. Can we work on it? Yeah, you bet. Uh, but uh, bottom line, better than what we had. Not the best thing that could be done, but better than what we had. Millions of Americans now have health insurance because the law has put it within financial reach. They are enrolling in Medicaid or buying private insurance with the help of tax credits and taking advantage of laws that prohibit insurers from denying coverage because of pre-existing conditions. Millions more have insurance that is cheaper, better or more comprehensive than what they could get before. They are more financially secure, they have better access to care, and they're probably getting healthier, too. There are, to give a couple examples, uh, let's say, uh, well, do we want to go through the examples? I don't want to leave people out. Marianne Hammers, who has stage 3 ovarian cancer and depends on her covered California policy to pay for her care, without fear of hitting an annual or lifetime limit on benefits. People like Claire and Allen Sechrist of North Carolina who can afford the comprehensive insurance they need for a series of ongoing health issues because of the tax credits they get through healthcare.gov. Uh, I think you get the idea. 
uh, Precious Young of Los Angeles. I don't want to leave anybody out. I feel bad for, I mean, why would I leave Precious Young out? She qualifies for Medicaid and depends on it to pay for her psychiatric medication. They do not account for the totality of the Affordable Care Impact, uh, Affordable Care Act's impact. Obviously, that's three people. There are millions. I would be here forever. The health care law has treated some people well and some people poorly, and if it's working well in some parts of the country like California, it's not working well in others like Tennessee. Millions of people aren't happy with their coverage, with the premiums and deductibles that seem too high and the physician networks that seem too small. As plans have pulled out of markets because of losses, many of these people have watched nervously to see whether they had have any insurance options at all. Over the last few years, and especially over the last few months, Republicans have shown a spotlight on those people to highlight everything that's gone wrong with the 2010 health care law. In the past week, President Donald Trump presided in an event with Obamacare, quote, victims who had lost access to physicians. And Mike, uh, Mike Pence, speaking in Ohio, told the story of a small business owner struggling to pay coverage costs for employees. But as they spoke, uh, they spoke as if these stories were emblematic of the law's full impact, Calling it a nightmare, that's Pence's preferred term, and a disaster, that's Trump's favorite. Obamacare has wreaked havoc on the lives of the innocent, hardworking Americans, etc., etc. Um, at the time, uh, it looked uh, like when McConnell said on Tuesday that we have a duty to act, it looked like he might actually succeed, much as it did back in November and December, after Trump won the election, sort of, kind of. But then something unexpected happened. All those people benefited from the health care law and their friends and families and allies in the progressive organizing community began speaking out. They showed up at town hall meetings and at congressional offices. They made calls and made posters and sent a whole lot of tweets. Republicans couldn't ignore those voices. Many of them eventually did. But because they were coming from inside their districts and states, they promised not to pull the rug out from under people with Medicaid or take away protections for people with pre-existing conditions, but then many of them went ahead and did that anyway. But that is precisely what their plans called for doing. One plan the Senate considered would have reduced the number of people with coverage by $22 million, the Congressional Budget Office determined, another by $32 million, and yet another, the one that failed early Friday morning, by $16 million. These numbers provided critics with devastating rhetorical weapons. You get the idea here. Uh, and I think uh, time being what it is, uh, and very little of it being left to us. I think I'll move on from there and uh, see what else we can capture before we close things down for Friday and I begin considering what I need to record for you for Monday. I think that's going to have to be the solution once again on our way out of town as uh, we uh, take advantage of the summer vacation. And I, I will be someplace that I think I could probably broadcast to you at least 9 to 11, but I'm unsure of the stability of the Internet connection. Best probably to go with a recorded piece. Uh, let's also at least uh, take note of the latest explosion inside the White House and the drama that exists there. I think we owe a small debt of gratitude in the collapse of all this, by the way, to Anthony Scaramucci and his laser-like focus as the new communications chief in the White House on Anthony Scaramucci. It is interesting. The guy, apparently there's some ambiguity about whether he's actually really officially on board at the White House, too. I think they were trying to pull some sort of paperwork trick because he's got an ethical situation. He's got to, I guess, sell off his business uh, it, well, Trump was supposed to sell off his businesses, but he waived it, you know, for himself. He doesn't really feel like he needs to do that. Scaramucci, uh, I guess it's much easier to separate himself from the business, and he'd like the big bundle of cash, no doubt. Uh, and I'm not even sure what the details are, but as I recall reading and passing, they were going to monkey with the starting date that they put on his paperwork so that he could finish up the sale of his company and not have an ethical problem. Although, I mean, the fact that we know the name Anthony Scaramucci and he's doing communications for the White House right now, I think belies what they're trying to put on the paperwork. Anyway, in addition to all of that, the work that he has been doing, he's come in at a critical moment for the administration. They're supposed to be trying to pass their top priority through Congress after a six-month struggle on something that was supposed to be so easy. And Scaramucci doesn't have anything that breaks through anyway to say to the press about that top presidential priority. The whole tenure 
of a few days has been about Anthony Scaramucci and his views on Anthony Scaramucci, which is amazing and should get you fired. But it won't because Trump likes to keep the focus on Trump and he likes Scaramucci because Scaramucci is something of a mini Trump, except eventually it'll dawn on Trump that he's not enough of a mini Trump. A, a, a Trump himself keeps the focus on Trump. A mini Trump should keep the focus on Trump, except uh, somehow it has worked out very poorly and mini Trump is keeping the focus on mini Trump instead. And the latest explosion in all of this, in addition to his ongoing fight with Rents Priebus, which is weird, and the one we were talking about yesterday, and him calling the FBI, asking for them to please help him investigate how his disclosure got disclosed. He's now also apparently in a fight with Steve Bannon. And I, I think I can't say, I mean, we, we give ourselves a pass, and I think we get a pass from the public when we talk about the president's access Hollywood tapes and the words that it, I, I, I guess, by default uh, in all of this, we get to say on the air in the context of, well, it's not me saying it. I'm not saying it. I'm just quoting the president. Well, I can't, I'm pretty sure. Well, I don't know. I guess in another context, if I'm talking about, you know, chickens, I guess I can talk about what Anthony Scaramucci said about Steve Bannon. But Steve's not a chicken, so I don't think I can make it work. Uh, Ryan Litza in The New Yorker is writing this morning about, or wrote yesterday about this, I, and I guess he was the guy on the receiving end of the phone call, if I have this right, during which Anthony Scaramucci said that he wasn't like Steve Bannon because Steve he's not like Steve Bannon is so often found to be doing trying to uh something something blah I think you all know the quote yada yada uh reference to chicken but not in that context you got me and I think Ryan Litza was the one on the other end of that phone call and I don't I don't know why he makes any phone call at all Scaramucci he's not even supposed to be working at the White House how does he do this uh so Ryan's got this piece here we'll just tell you about I don't know if we're going to bother trying to cram in the reading of it, but Anthony Scaramucci called me to unload about White House leakers, Rents Priebus and Steve Bannon. He started by threatening to fire the entire White House communication staff and it escalated from there. That's the story. Scaramucci, uh, in the photo illustrating the piece here, wearing his mirrored shades that uh, I think are more evocative of Milo Yiannopoulos than uh, he's probably be comfortable with. But uh, what can you do? I don't know where he is mentally on that. On Wednesday night, it says, I received a phone call from Anthony Scaramucci, the new White House communications director. He wasn't happy. Earlier in the night, I'd tweeted, citing a senior White House official, that Scaramucci was having dinner at the White House with President Trump, the First Lady, Sean Hannity, and the former Fox News executive Bill Schein. He was the one, by the way, that did so much to cover up the culture and ongoing culture of sexual harassment at Fox News that eventually ended up pushing out uh, Roger Ailes, uh, and, uh, and, and Bill O'Reilly, I guess, as well. And, uh, they have, uh, much more to go. But Bill Shine spent years there trying to cover that stuff up and excuse it. So that's great dinner company for the president. It was an interesting group and raised some questions. Ryan writes, was Trump getting strategic advice from Hannity? Was he considering hiring Shine? But Scaramucci had his own question. For me, who leaked that to you? He asked. I said I couldn't give him that information. That's usually pretty obvious. He responded by threatening to fire the entire White House communications staff. <laughs> whatever. I mean, he's not even on board there, and he's not the chief of staff, but he likes to threaten that for whatever reason, and that's really interesting. So maybe he has some control over the communications staff. Maybe not. I don't really know. But I like. I, did did Ryan laugh at that? If you're a reporter. And you're reporting on the Trump White House and they say, who leaked that to you? I can't tell you. Well, I'm going to fire the whole White House communication staff. I feel like, are you, I, is that supposed to mean something to me? I, what do I care? Go ahead. Fire them. Fire them twice. Uh, what? You don't fire me. I, you, you don't like revoke my press pass. I mean, that would bother me if you wanted to do that. I'd fight you on it. But what do I care that you're going to fire the whole communication staff? Well, he goes on. What I'm going to do is I will eliminate everyone in the comms team and we'll start over, he said. Oh, good, he did laugh. Look, there we go. It's noted right here. Ryan says, I laughed. Not sure if he really believed that such a threat would convince a journalist to reveal a source. 
He continued to press me. Thank God he laughed. It's about time. I continue, He continued to press me and complain about the staff he's inherited in his new job. I ask these guys not to leak anything and they can't help themselves, he said. You're an American citizen. This is a major catastrophe for the American country. So I'm asking you as an American patriot to give me a sense of who leaked it. Can you imagine prevailing on somebody? Oh, no. Oh, no. The, the word is out on who the president is having dinner with. It's a major catastrophe for the American country. I mean, maybe he means in general the culture of leaking. And that could be true. But uh, I'm not going to solve it. I'm a reporter. Uh, if I'm Ryan, anyway. In Scaramucci's view, the fact that the world, the word of the dinner, sorry, had reached a reporter was evidence that his rivals in the West Wing, particularly Rents Priebus, the White House chief of staff, were plotting against him. While they have publicly maintained that there is no bad blood between them, Scaramucci and Priebus were, have been feuding for months. After the election, Trump asked Scaramucci to join his administration, and Scaramucci sold his company, Skybridge Capital, in anticipation of taking on a senior role, but Priebus didn't want him in the White House and successfully blocked him from being appointed to a job until last week when Trump offered him the comms job over Priebus's vehement objections. And in response to Scaramucci's appointment, Sean Spicer, an ally of Priebus's, resigned. And in an additional slight to Priebus, the White House official announcement of Scaramucci's hiring noted that he would report directly to the president rather than the chief of staff. Interesting. Um, I really wasn't interested in reading through the entirety of this thing, and I guess I'll, I'll hold to that because we are running short on time, but I, I wanted to at least note some of Scaramucci's role, I think, in all of the political developments of the last 24 hours. Yes, I do lay some small slice of the blame for the health care story at his feet, even though I have no real direct connection, and, and ordinarily they wouldn't have anything to do with it, but the fact... Uh, and and also, for a long time, people said, oh, no, this is part of the White House policy. They want to distract us with the drama of what's going on in the White House so that they can slip past, slip the bill past and send it. Well, it didn't work. It didn't distract America, and it didn't work to gather the votes either. And I think at some point you have to consider whether or not it was really wise to hire a White House communications director who was going to be such a circus clown in the face of all this. This couldn't have given anybody inside the Senate any confidence whatsoever in the White House. And also, it's just a dereliction of duty. If the president's top legislative priority is on the Senate floor, you can't take the focus off that. Even if you're instructed that the focus needs to be directed elsewhere so that people will you know, become distracted. And you just say that's just a bad strategy. And if it gets you fired, it gets you fired. Too bad. Anyway, uh, let's see. There's much more, and uh, somehow I must have closed pocket somewhere along the line, and I haven't even gotten to what I put aside for the day. Uh, let's see. You know what? Here, let me uh, pull this one up because uh, uh, I was asked by Darwin Darko to uh, read this on the air, and I, I've put myself behind the eight ball here in terms of getting things done by uh, talking so long about other things. But he, he I, I should at least note for you, there's a New York Times piece from David Brooks, and maybe we do need to check in with the horrible, horrible David Brooks. Jeff Flake plants a flag. That's datelined this morning from David Brooks. Let's at least see what this is about and uh, see if we can't uh, uh, give you a good idea. Uh, do you ever get the feeling, Brooks writes, we're all going to be judged for this moment? Historians, our grandkids and ourselves will look and ask, what did you do as the Trump Scaramucci Bannon administration <laughs> dropped the nuclear bomb on the basic standards of decency in public life? What did you do as the American Congress ceased to function? What positions did you take as America teetered toward national decline? My answer, of course, would be I blamed both sides. And uh, someday... David Brooks will tell his children and grandchildren, will insist to them that he did not blame both sides, at which point they should tear him limb from limb, shred him, and put his, uh, uh, I would say, uh, charbroiled remains, uh, uh, make them available at the Applebee's salad bar. But I don't want to really encourage violence. For most of us, it's relatively easy to pass the test, not you. But for the rest of us, our jobs are not on the line when we call out the mind boggling monstrosity of what's happening for Republican senators. It's harder. Their consciences pull them one way to tell the truth, while the political interests pull them another way to keep their heads down. 
I would say to lie is the answer. Oh, I'm getting a, uh, oh, we're getting some uh, emergency warnings that I just can't mute. So you all are going to be worried. Uh, but it's important for you to know that there is a flash flood warning for this area uh, until 2.45 p.m. I don't even believe it's actually been raining around me, but uh, that would make the floods that much more of a surprise, wouldn't it? Okay, so we don't, uh, believe me, we give, you the, we give you the weather on this show. Well, whether we like it or not. I got all that muted, but uh, there's no muting the flash flood warning, apparently. Anyway, some senators, Brooks wrote, are passing the test of conscience. Ben Sass, no, he didn't. Lindsey Graham, no, he didn't. Susan Collins, she did. Mike Lee, no. John McCain, yes. And add to that list, uh, it says here, we can certainly add Arizona Senator Jeff Flake. Why? I don't know. In a few days, he comes out with a book called The Conscience of a Conservative which is a thoughtful defense of traditional conservatism and a thorough assault on the way Donald Trump is betraying it. Flake grew up in rural Arizona. Cattle ranching is the hardest work I've ever known, and the best people I've ever known have been cattle ranchers. He writes, that's so nice. He was one of 11 children, and his family did not dine out even once while he was young. (laughs) The David Brooks measure of true salt of the earth they didn't even dine out once like oh my god I, it's interesting i feel so bad for them they dine out didn't even dine out once i you know what i bet they did but that doesn't really count like for for uh david brooks dining out means l'auberge chez francois for you and me well i was out of the house so eating mcdonald's is dining out Speaking of which, uh, I, I, I'm not going to be able to get through all of uh, all of this, and I, I don't think I would ever be able to get through all of David Brooks, period. But uh, speaking of dining out, I did see a clip circulating yesterday on YouTube of uh, Scaramucci, of course, because why else would the focus be elsewhere, arguing with a reporter who looked to be or sounded to be a British reporter about uh, uh, how well, Scaramucci was trying to make the point that uh, Trump had turned him on to the you know anti elites message, and he didn't really get that until he came on board. That he had spent his life on Wall Street trying to become one of the financial elites, and Trump, who is one of the financial elites anyway, really uh, changed his mind about that, and he tried to say he was trying to argue to this reporter that Trump was both somebody who had access to the elites because of the money he had and the success, as he put it, that he, tried, he had had in, in making the money, even though that's debatable, uh, but that he had a great understanding of every the everyman struggle because he wasn't an elite. And she was asking, what what is it that, about Trump that isn't elite? And he actually tried to argue that the fact that he eats cheeseburgers and pizza was, well, that means he's not elite. And she didn't buy it for a second. I mean, not even a microsecond uh, to her credit. What are you talking about? Everybody eats cheeseburgers and pizza. That doesn't make anybody elite or not elite. Oh, uh, but he is insisting that it does. By the way, recall, please, that he eats pizza with a knife and fork. And I don't think that's necessarily elitist. It's just atrocious, but uh, uh, I don't know. It doesn't prove anything one way or the other, uh, even in the negative. It was such a dumb idea to try to convince somebody that he was something other than a, a, a... an elitist because he ate cheeseburgers. Anyway, just thought I'd put that out there for uh, everyone's edification. Let's see. Uh, I also have some great suggestions here that came from Scott Anderson that I won't be able to get to, but I can record later for your enjoyment on Monday. I think they're fun things. Maybe we can pick up the slack and check out a couple of other things too and add it in to make for an entertaining Monday show, since we have no idea what's going to happen over this weekend. This could be a hell of a weekend. It could be a terrible day. And by Monday, it might be obvious it's a terrible day to be off the air. But I I will say we'll find you some entertaining material nonetheless. It won't make any difference, really. I don't think there's going to be any coherent way of cover. If it becomes the mess that I think it could become over the weekend, there won't be any coherent way of covering any of that. All right. I also want to remind you, if you didn't take a look at the links that we provided in yesterday's summary, thanks to Scott Anderson again on that one, I did include a write-up from way, way long ago, back when they were working on the Affordable Care Act, about the importance of the conference and the mechanics of the conference. And uh, it's a good place to go to straighten out whether I had it exactly right yesterday. And I don't think I had it exactly, exactly right yesterday, but it was the best of my recollection. Um uh, I'll include it again in today's roundup, I guess, hopefully with a special note uh, just to point out exactly what it is. 
the mechanics of conference and possession of the papers, something I did way back in 2010. And so uh, if you were looking to get the straight dope on exactly how that worked and instead of relying on my struggle to remember off on the fly yesterday, uh, that's out there and uh, well worth going over if you're interested in the procedural nuts and bolts for your weekend conversation. If you are, um, I suggest you get a life, but, uh, you know, I, I will have no suggestions about where to get one because that's my life. All right. And uh, let's see. Finally, I guess before we break off, one other thing I wanted to note that uh, the uh, public integrity people were working on, public, Center for Public Integrity at publicintegrity.org, pointing out, as long as we're on the subject, sort of, of Steve Bannon, uh, their headline, Steve Bannon has a shadow press office and it might violate federal law it's not uh, the 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 federal law that you would ordinarily guess at but it might violate federal law nonetheless it's actually just more of a weird thing and a, a giant suspicious spot in all of this but just to let you know what's going on here in an arrangement that prominent ethics experts say is without precedent oh no and potentially illegal but not as illegal as you think The White House is referring questions for senior presidential advisor Stephen Bannon to an outside public relations agent whose firm says she's working for free. That's actually quite that. That's what makes it illegal, believe it or not, that she's working for free. Not the part that uh, is just about him having his own press agency. But imagine that. I have a question for a White House advisor. Well, we're referring those questions to an outside PR firm. Alexandra. Preate, I don't know how she pronounces this, P-R-E-A-T-E, a 46-year-old New Yorker and veteran Republican media strategist, describes herself as Bannon's personal spokesperson. So I guess that's where the questions go about what is he sucking today, because apparently that's in the news. I think you have some idea about that. Bannon's personal spokesperson, that's what she calls himself, herself, but she also collaborates with other White House officials on public messaging and responses to press inquiries. It was, in fact, Preate however she pronounces that, who responded when the Center for Public Integrity recently asked the White House press office questions about Bannon. Now, the illegality comes in with her working for free because it apparently violates the Anti-Deficiency Act, which basically means that you can't have anybody working for free like that. And that's not very exciting area of law, and it's kind of a stretch to try to find a way to make it illegal. But mostly it's unethical to have an outside PR firm answering questions like that on a personal level for a White House uh, official. But anyway, I thought I'd put that on the record just in case that blows up into something. Uh, I don't think it's going to overshadow uh, the things Scaramucci has to say about Bannon, to be sure. But uh, all of that is going to be overshadowed somehow. I guess Trump is going to have to find some way to get out for golf this weekend. If we're having flash floods up here, maybe he'll go to New Jersey, but I think they're getting even more rain. Anyway, anything we might have missed today can surely be scooped up by the guys on the After Show, Wink and Justice, standing by to bring you the Angle of Repose Friday show. The Dallas Cowboys release a player who was wrongly accused of shoplifting while keeping over a dozen players recently convicted on weapons charges, domestic abuse, and DUIs. The favored stuff, I guess, among the NFL players. A Kansas SWAT raid over tea leaves and tomato plants outrages a panel of federal judges, and Democrats insist on an investigation into the Trump administration's blackmail over the health care votes. They ought to have that. That's a good call. From Daily Coast Radio. On NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the Kegro in the Morning Show with David Waltman. And thanks for your patience earlier this morning. Well, let's look at what else is they've got here for the last half. Facebook reported to U.S. officials that they found evidence of Russians spying on the French elections. And Trump is doing all he can to burst the coastal property bubble as over 64% of Miami property owners are oblivious to the threat of sea level rise. All that next on the After Show.